right from the beginning, I knew I wanted to incorporate my Maori culture and me learning more about it into my work and sharing that as a form of storytelling. I was just hit with this image of me knitting a cowl, but incorporating Maori motifs, even though I didn't know what those motifs meant or um, exactly like how this particular image came to mind because I wasn't super familiar with a lot of these motifs, but it just stuck with me. And, uh, and actually when I did receive that vision, I was kind of shocked because I was like, I never had any sort of like exposure to Maori art. So for it to be coming up that specifically in my mind, like quite detailed and precise, I think it was a little bit of um, sort of like ancestral intervention. Like them, I, I kind of see it as them like actually calling out to me saying like, it's time for you to learn more about where you come from and this is the way that you're going to do it. Welcome to the Crimson Stitchery, a video channel about making all things beautiful and useful. Today I'm joined by a very special guest who is Françoise Danoy of Aroha Knits. Over the last few months, Françoise and I have been engaged in a design collaboration project where we've been designing an accessories collection of four pieces inspired by the winter solstice. We've called it Midwinter Knits. We're really, really excited to be introducing that project. And today Françoise has joined me on the channel in order to chat a little bit more about her background, her inspiration, and what's brought us together in this work. So thanks very much for joining me today, Françoise. Thank you so much for having me on and being part of this collaboration. It's been a lot of fun. Yes, it definitely has. So Françoise, I think that your work under Aroha Knits is probably best known for the way that you've integrated Maori symbolism, shape and pattern into your knitwear. Has that been something that has always interested you through knitting? I've always considered uh, my approach to knitwear design as sort of some sort of documentation of my journey and reclamation of my cultural heritage. So right from the beginning, I knew I wanted to incorporate my Maori culture and me learning more about it into my work and sharing that as a form of storytelling, not just for myself, but also for other people who might be in a similar situation as I am. Um, and in fact, that was like kind of how I got into even just knitting in the first place when I was um, knitting my very first project ever. And I remember the day it was January 2nd, 2014. That was the first day I picked up my knitting needles for the first time. Um, my mother was teaching me how to knit because I just saw her knitting. It looked fun. So I wanted to try it too. So it, my first project was a cow knit in the round on really big chunky yarn. And as I was knitting that project, I was just hit with this image of me knitting a cowl like that, like, you know, same sort of shape, but incorporating Maori motifs, even though I didn't know what those motifs meant or um, exactly like how this particular image came to mind because I wasn't super familiar with a lot of these motifs, but it just stuck with me. And so I started designing my own patterns just a few months afterwards, just in, a, in an attempt to try and recreate this image that I had in my head, that vision I guess I sort of had. And since then, um, my designing has just been a pursuit of just learning more about who I am, where I come from, and then finding ways to translate that into a knitting pattern. So when you say that you yourself weren't initially that familiar with the Maori motifs or, or maybe you recognise them, but you said you were kind of exploring the meanings and so on. Um, in what kind of context were you familiar with the imagery? Like, you know, how, did you have it at home or, you know, how, how did you kind of view it in your own life before working it into your knitting? That's a really good question. So I grew up as a diaspora Maori. Um, diaspora mean like I just I wasn't born on the land. I grew out. I grew up outside of the land, outside of the culture, and. Um, Actually, I, growing up, I actually grew up quite religious. Um, my mother's side of the family, interesting enough, like it's all it's like six generations of Maori Mormons. And so we grew up Mormon first. Um, the way that I, we kind of saw it in my family was we were Mormon first, French second, American third, and then Maori last. Um, so I grew up with very, very limited um, access to the culture and understanding of the culture. Uh, because uh, at least within the family, we were more focused on being re raised religious and focusing on my dad's side of the culture because between the two cultures, French and Maori, uh, France was considered to be the more, um, not profitable, it was the more 
like if you knew how to speak French, if you knew the French culture and stuff like that, you were going to have more opportunities in life. And now here I am teaching the Maori language as one of my side jobs. So now who's, you know, <laughs> and I'm hardly using my French anymore. Um, so it was very limited. Um, but I just knew growing up, like, like people would ask me like, oh, where are you from? Because obviously I don't look <laughs> exactly like I'm from around here. So I'd say, oh, I'm French. And then there'd be that, that slight pause and that, you know, people just look at me and just like, okay, you're French, but you're also something else. And then I'll say, oh, I, I'm also Maori. And then they'll ask, oh, what's a Maori? And I'll be like, I don't know. I don't I mean in native uh, indigenous New Zealanders, but that was like all of the information that I really knew. I just knew that we uh, we were indigenous to New Zealand, but in terms of just like the images and like stuff that I could talk about the culture, it was just like ah, uh, I guess we uh, wore grass skirts and stuff like that, like very stereotypical uh, cliche imagery. Like I didn't know what a modern modern Maori would even look like, or that we even existed. Like I thought we were just pretty much like a dead civilization, a dead culture, because of that um, um, displacement and also just living living in the United States. Like there are not many other Maori, if any, living in Texas. Um, we were lucky, just we were just lucky enough to meet other Polynesians in the area. Um, so uh, to answer your question in a very short and succinct way, very limited. Um, uh, and actually, when I re did receive that vision of just like me working up those motifs, I was kind of shocked because I was like, I never had any sort of like exposure to Maori art. So for it to be coming up that specifically in my mind, like quite detailed and precise, I think it was a little bit of um, sort of like ancestral intervention. Like them, I, I kind of see it as them like actually calling out to me saying like, it's time for you to learn more about where you come from and this is the way that you're going to do it. Mm. Mm. That's really, really fascinating. And I think, yeah, what you're talking about, that sort of sense of displacement and dispersal and the sort of then desire to go back and investigate, but also very much reclaim and, and relearn something which in, in many cases is actually, you know, sort of more than your heritage, but also part of your right. Um, so you grew up in the US. Yes. So where did you go then? Like, what? where could you go to find out more about these motifs and the meaning? I'm, I'm curious as like growing up in, in Texas yourself. So I would say that like my journey has been like in two main stages. Um, and it's something that I talk about in one of my workshops or lectures that I like to do every once in a while. Combining culture and creativity. So basically the first stage was kind of like my solitary pursuit. So it was very much me just trying to figure things out on my own from internet, books and things like that, just me trying to figure out what um, what I could piece together from my, what I could gather and access online. And then over the years, as I started learning more about myself, um, I started reaching out to other Maori within the knitting community uh, who were able to find me. At the time I was living in Japan, um, so uh, that also made my journey interesting as well because there was a lot of books that I wanted to get access to, but they were only accessible within New Zealand. So trying to f find things like that in Japan was tricky. Um, but in 2019, I did have the opportunity to go back home and visit my grandfather for the first time in like over a decade. And that was a very pivotal turning point within my journey because it started shifting from me trying to figure things out on my own to me building a community of people around me who would help me and mentor me and guide me within this journey of the self-discovery. And that actually did have a huge shift in the way that I perceived myself because um, before that I did, have, I definitely struggled with a lot of imposter syndrome and thinking like, am I really Maori? Like, um, even though like I'm like one generation displaced from New Zealand, like is that, can I still call myself Maori? Even though I had no problems with like calling myself French, even though it's the exact same on each side and I displaced one generation, um, you know, being born in Australia, um, had no problem with like people telling people, yeah, I'm French, but when I would say like, oh, I'm Maori as well, like I would always feel this, this sort of like, um, oh, I feel like I'm being fake. Um, but once I started talking and meeting and bringing all um, these other people that I trusted into my inner circle to help me with this journey, it definitely shifted. It was like, oh yeah, there are so many different ways for us to be Maori. There's no one certain way. And the, there's a lot of overlap in our stories, but also the diversity and the differences in our stories just really helps add to the beauty of of this mosaic of what a modern Maori can look like and there's just no one way to do so. Now it's really um, 
talking with other people, staying in close contact with my family. That's where I am in my journey right now. And that's definitely been like super rewarding and really um, fulfilling and enriching. Mm, thank you for sharing. Yeah, I can definitely relate to a lot of things that you're saying. Like I myself am from a mixed diasporan background as well. You know, I'm Asian and I'm European, I'm Eurasian. Um, and in my case, like we have examples of multiple migrations. So like I'm five or six generations out of China and I consider myself more Southeast Asian and don't really relate, you know, because people left so long ago, even back to the kind of so-called homelands. And I definitely remember like growing up and reading, you know, you know, like fairy tales and fairy stories and stuff like that. And in the UK, at least, that kind of literature is very much dominated by um, obviously European folk tales and things like that um, from, you know, all the way across Europe, but also Greek and Roman kind of legends. And I remember just like every now and then I'd find some kind of Chinese fairy stories, which as a child were so, you know, thrilling and important to me to sort of get those little little glimpses of, of heritage in the past. And there's really something about doing that through cultural artefacts, through storytelling and through, you know, material culture, through objects, through imagery and pattern that kind of like brings it home to the individual more than the kind of you know the kind of grandiose things like history tales do, do you know do you know what I mean like the kind of more formal the more formal history um I think um was there was there anything in particular do you think that has really drawn you um to Maori imagery you know object history um storytelling and you know is there like one thing in in particular that that really appeals to you or that has kind of piqued your interest I wonder oh I think I'm still very much in my like discovery phase I mean I'm always going to be in the discovery phase there's always something new that I learn about Maori culture that just adds like another layer of depth and complexity and beauty um to the culture whether it's like even within just the one certain art form like whether it's weaving or um Actually, the different, the many different types of uh, weaving forms. Uh, I mean, even within that, just learning about the different motifs. But um, there's just always something new to explore. So I just sometimes just get just dive deep into each one and just learning as much as I can. Mm -hmm. um, like I have tried um, venturing into other art forms like song and dance. I have found that I'm terrible at both. So my strengths is really just like being able to create with my hands and what these guys can do. So I've been really focusing on that so the different types of weaving um learning how to do them in like the traditional forms and then try and find ways to translate that into a knitting pattern which has been really fun so as i learn as i you know design my patterns i also do want to learn the traditional forms itself so i can really engage with that on a more, on a more personal level for myself Mm. That's something for, for, that I think for me has always really stood out is the way that you're kind of, you know, relaying shape and pattern and motif and then putting it onto knitting. And then I think what's really interesting about your work is that you you find a way to make it uniquely about knitting, but also kind of un, unmistakably Maori. And there's something really interesting about that, I think, because so often when it comes to, you know, any kind of... Um, not just textile art, but any kind of, you know, craft. Sometimes you have like the shapes of things that are quite bound into their discipline, if that makes sense. Like, mm -hmm. you know, a kind of shape that belongs in wood or a shape that belongs in plaster carving or a shape that belongs in embroidery. But I think what's interesting for you is that you've managed to transcend the disciplines through the way that you play, play around with those techniques. Oh, well, thank you for saying that. There's definitely been some, there have been, yeah, there's definitely some things that are bound to the art form. Like um, sometimes I'll try to take inspiration from traditional wood carving for Kaido. Obviously there's some things that I just won't be able to do, but I, so I do try to um, evoke the same feel. And um, so I'll, for example, for wood carving, since it's very like textured, I do try to use something like twisted stitches to evoke that same feel. So even though it's not like a one-to-one -one representation, it's just more about just evoking the same feel about it. Um, maybe if I just go off a little bit tangent, just thinking about that. So for example, for Kaido, which is the wood carving, that was inspired, and it's also within the name itself. Um, it's based off the word faka and ido. Ido is a little maggot or a little bug, a little grub. Um, that eats through wood and actually leaves these kind of types of uh, grooves in the wood. And it's from that that, you know, people were inspired to also do the same thing with the wood. So even though um, maybe with uh, traditional wood carving, ours come out a little bit like the actual look like actual images and a little bit more precise and a little bit more detailed, what it's inspired off of in the first place um, 
from that little grub, I guess maybe I'm doing the same thing with my nin. Like maybe it's not going to be 100% representation, but it's taking inspiration from the original source and finding ways to translate that into that new medium. Does that make sense? Yeah, of- yeah. Like it's, part, <laughs> so it's the process. It's the process of how you're how you're putting it together and how you're working yeah. as a designer. Yeah, that totally makes sense to me. I guess what I'm interested also, you know, because our world is you know, very completely globalised. And I think especially through what we do um, as running knitting businesses, you know, online, we met online. Um, I don't know about you, but for me, like I couldn't have done anything with what I do if it wasn't for social media and so on. And you kind of have this interesting currency of like you're global and then you're kind of tapping into your your personal and your local traditions at the same time. So I guess mm-hmm. what what I find, uh, what I'd love to get your input on is, um, how do you how do you feel about the concept of ownership um, of heritage, especially in the way that that you work? Because you know, with with knitwear design, you know, it's not like other forms of arts and crafts where you might you know make a piece and then sell that piece. But in effect, what we're 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 selling in a way is is the right in order, like the commercial right in order to create something from our intellectual property right so kind of from our ideas to then hand it off over to to somebody else the maker so when it comes to sort of what we've been discussing about you know traditional motifs and reinterpretations um you know i just wondered like what are your thoughts about who the imagery belongs to and how that kind of transcends as it you know gets released from <laughs> from our needles? Oh, that's a really good question. Dang. Oh, let's see. I'm going to have to think about how to answer that one. Well, first of all, um, with my patterns, I always do try to make sure to use imagery and motif that isn't... Um, like, even though um, it is um, not exclusive, to, like, it's specifically from my culture, it is also something that can be shared with other people. So on the flip side, so for example, I would never design a pattern that would evoke traditional uh, Maori uh, tattoos because that is a closed practice within our culture. Um, I will wear it in my, like for example, I'll wear the, the mokokowai stencils in my photography because that's on my body. And even though people have my imagery, it's still like, you know, because it's on the pattern, um, you know, that's not evoked in the actual pattern that they're knitting up um, themselves. Um, So for the actual designs that I put out, like it is something that can be shared with other people. And also like, because I do incorporate my own story in there, uh, it has my own personal touch in there as well. When I share my stories, it's always like finding that it's an interesting balance between, um, I think anybody can really relate to the stories and that, but they find what's really interesting how it's make my work stand out is like what makes it specific to me, like connecting back to my culture and my small specifics. But a lot of people from different backgrounds can relate to the journey that I'm going on. So it's kind of like that global and also very specific type of um, work. Yeah, 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 definitely. Um, so you said that you first... Um, learned to knit like you know less than a decade ago through your mum and I guess I'm curious as well like did your mum do a lot of knitting when you were when you were growing up is that something that was around you a lot no she just picked up knitting two months before I did um so I was living back in the states at that time waiting to get my U.S. citizenship there was like this whole thing about like you know moving to Japan green card yada 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 and so when I was living back at home with my parents she picked up knitting like a few months before she started teaching me because she, we just had seen like the second Hunger Games movie and there was like a piece in there that Katniss, the main character was wearing. Like it was like the snood cow vest combo thing. My mom really wanted to make it. So she picked up knitting so she could learn how to make that. And um, it looked really fun. So I asked her to teach me the basics. And then afterwards I just went like completely off the rails. It just was surpassed her just like a few short weeks and things like that. So um, growing up, um, like I didn't really grow up with like my par- either of my parents being super crafty. Like my mom taught me the basics of sewing. Um, I mostly was off in my own little corner just drawing drawing stuff all the time. Like I like to draw, I like to sketch and stuff like that. And my dream growing up was actually being a comic book artist, but that didn't work out. <laughs> um, so I just thought it was really interesting as well that my chosen field ended up being something in the arts and crafts because up until that point like I was pretty much on track to like go to law school become a lawyer maybe go to practice law in New Zealand for like land rights (laughs) that was something that my mom really wanted me to do she was like you should go for that and here I am now designing knitting patterns and things like that um 
so no, I didn't really grow up with lots of arts and crafts, but I guess I did grow up with like my mom's sense of like, you know, take names and kick butts type of attitude. <laughs> so... But actually, I really like the fact that, you know, you just, you and your mom both just came to knitting and then just took it up and just always made it whatever you wanted it to be. In a way, mm -hmm. that's really nice because in some ways you're like not really held back by, I think, imagery or ideas of, you know, what one should make or, you know, you've got to knit all of the baby garments for your grandkid. Or do, do you know what yeah. I mean? All of these yeah. kind of cultural restrictions or, you know, yeah, ideas of, of, of what it should be like, but actually you can just kind of leap in at the deep end and just start designing straight away as well, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> which is fabulous. Should we get on to our collaboration? Yes, let's do that. So I was delighted to invite Francoise to work with me for what's become an annual event at the Crimson Stitchery, whereby I invite another designer to collaborate with me on a, a winter accessories collection. Um, Francoise was actually suggested to me by one of my Patreon supporters. So thank you very, very much for everybody who got in to nominate names. Um, yeah, you were a very, very popular suggestion. Really? And I was like, yeah, yeah. Wow, I was like, thank oh. you, Patreon. I'm flattered. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, you know, I, I, I'd known of your work for a long time and I always admired your work. And then I just had all of these, you know, wonderful supporters behind me like, yeah, yeah, you should do it. You should do it. We'd love to see what you can come up with. And I thought, why not? I'll just, I'll just fire off an email. And um, it's been a really, really fun experience. I've, I've really enjoyed it myself. Yeah. Um, and I think what's been so nice is the way that, you know, working with another designer, what can become quite a solitary practice really just becomes about like fusing different ideas and seeing how we can pull completely different things kind of out of each other as well um, across the board. Um, so when I first approached Francoise, we were talking about, you know, the, the kind of collections that I do, the Crimson Stitchery and the fact that, you know, I was looking at the winter solstice and the, the midwinter time. And your immediate response was to talk about Matariki. Yes, yeah, so Matariki is the Maori New Year celebration that happens around June or July. Matariki refers to a cluster of stars. In English, it's the Pleiades uh, constellation, I believe. And once the, this particular set of stars is visible or rises above the horizon, that single signals the mark of the new year down in, in New Zealand. And so obviously in winter in New Zealand's around, it's like in June and July, so halfway through the year. Um, so for me, when I think of winter now for like New Year celebrations and things like that, Matariki uh, immediately comes to mind. Um, so that's something that I really wanted to explore within the project together. And Matariki, because it focuses on a constellation of stars, I did want to evoke stars within our patterns, which led to really interesting choices in the yarn and then also uh, choices in the stitch patterns as well. Um, one thing that I actually never got around to figuring out was uh, one thing that I was curious about was like, okay, Matariki starts when these particular set of stars is visible in New Zealand. Um, would they become visible to those living like in the on the Northern Hemisphere during our winter? I haven't really figured that out yet, but that's something I do want to oh, yeah. <laughs> um, maybe do some more research into. Because so growing up, I was also really into astronomy and, and stars and stuff like that. So anything that where I can incorporate a little bit of astronomy into my work was also just like a little extra bonus as well. Um, but I just learned about Matariki just a few years ago. And so every year, both during the um, new year, like uh, according to the Gregorian calendar, and then also during the new year down in New Zealand for Maori, I tried to um, incorporate those celebrations into my own yearly celebrations, I guess. Like I tried to follow those practices as well. It's not always successful, um, <laughs> but I'm just learning how to be more aware of it. I'm trying to be intentional with it as well. Yeah, I can definitely empathize with that. I mean, I, you know, we have the Lunar New Year in, in Chinese culture, obviously it, it moves, you know, according to the lunar calendar and we always try and do something here, but you know, the Chinese community in the UK is very, very, very small. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we really just have our family and it, you know, we always kind of try and do something and try and remember, but it's just not the same as when you are over there and, you know, you have everything kind of going on in the culture. So I think, yeah, just any any way of marking these kind of celebrations, even if they're quite small, are always very, you know, heartfelt and, and, and yeah. very meaningful. Um, so the way that Francoise and I worked at the beginning is that we just start, you know, we had the loose theme of the winter solstice and we just started by just pulling a lot of imagery 
into a Pinterest board together and just kind of ruminating on how we could blend our different um, our different styles really and our very different influences. I'm always influenced by things like illustration and fashion history and kind of botanical imagery and then Francoise was always pulling across um, lots of work by Maori artists and there was one piece in particular that I think really cinched um, everything together, which was a weaving by the artist Sonia Snowden, which was this really, really, really small, beautiful piece. Um, well, actually, I, I say it's small, I don't know how big it is, but that has been acquired by a museum. And so for me, you know, as an outsider to, to your culture, it was so interesting to sort of learn about the celebrations. I think the way that the museum had positioned the work and so on um, through, through the textiles and kind of having that, that central. Obviously, the winter solstice, you know, it's the darkest day in the year. It's, it's the shortest day and the longest night. And I think that culturally around the world, you know, there's always an association with light and the bringing of light. Um, and so through learning about the, you know, the myths of Matariki, what was quite interesting is that it, it was all centred around the stars, whereas in Europe, the winter solstice is centered around the lack of sun right so it's, it's kind of a, like about the absence of light but then with the New Zealand story it was about the presence of an alternative light source which was really interesting to me and, and also the fact that it, it's a female myth about a mother and daughter um, whereas in you know in other cultures like the kind of the lack of the sun the sun has always been associated with like maleness so yeah that was just really 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 fascinating. Since the night sky was like kind of like the main focus for our piece, um, uh, choosing, finding ways to reflect that. For me, I always had used like stitch patterns to kind of represent my work. Whereas this is the first time where I was very intentional with the yarns to represent that as well. So we decided to choose um, to kind of hold two different types of yarns together. So for my pieces, this um, my so this is one of the pieces that I designed. Um, I used a yarn from Farmer's Daughter's Fibers or Rambouillet wool that she had paired up with a really beautiful fuzzy mohair that we got from Ito, um, their Sensai yarn. And so putting those together was to, you know, the wool is kind of be just like the night sky and then the mohair with its fuzzy halo texture was kind of like to represent the little, you know, glittering stars in there. And it really does create a really nice effect. I'm going to get really close up to the camera here. Focus on me. There we go. <laughs> Yeah, so for me, so it's a representation both in just like the yarn choices and then also the stitch pattern too. I found a pattern that's literally called the star stitch and so I incorporated that with the mohair, which is held double uh, for this piece. And so it creates a really nice effect here. So I've got my um, Starlit Night gloves here. Having the hand dyed yarn as a background with the kind of mohair fuzz was this really lovely opportunity to really evoke a starry sky because of that kind of mottled tonal kind of effect and then using mohair on top to kind of jump out and sparkle. So I decided to use a slip stitch colour work pattern so again, it's not stranded colour work, but it's using different techniques and again, playing around with, you know, the shininess of the superwash merino yarn background for me and the kind of the fuzzy halo of the mohair that just kind of sits on top was, was really fun. Another thing that Francoise and I discussed, which um, turned out to be really important to both of us, was the importance of also bringing up other people in the industry who are people of colour or who identify as such. That's something that I've just been trying to be more intentional um, in bringing in to who I work with, um, especially since like 2019. But even before that, um, I just, you know, as someone who is a person of colour myself, I, ident I mean, identify as um, the I part, the Indigenous part in there. Um, I did want to as much as possible, try and bring in as much as uh, um, other maker, uh, makers of color into my work. So, and since you and I, we are both uh, people of color, I thought it would be nice to try and incorporate as much as possible other people of color into our work. So I reached out to Farmer's Daughter Fibers, uh, Candace, who, all, who identifies as indigenous, um, uh, Native American, I believe she lives in Montana. Uh, for the wool and then for the mohair we reached out to Ito Sensai which is a Japanese company. Yes and I've been working with the Urban Pearl who is Layla who like me is also based in London and I just want to give a quick shout out to the BIPOC in Fibre directory which is mm -hmm. run by the wonderful Jeanette Sloan. It's an absolutely fantastic resource which we both used didn't we? Yes, yes we yeah. did. 
Yeah, it's a really nice thing to be able to do, I think. And just also just highlight other small businesses through, you know, we're also small businesses through this like small collaboration to try and kind of reach out. I think there's something that you've written, I think, on one of your blog posts that has always stood out for me, Francoise, which is that you don't, is it that you don't quite believe in competition? I how, how did you put it? Uh, collaboration over competition, which is a very common saying in a, like a lot of other industries. So I'm not the one who coined that term originally, but it is yeah. something that I do try to hold myself to. Like, even though we're all knitwear designers and things like that, I do believe that there is room for everybody because we are doing similar things, but it's our unique perspectives and the nuances that we can add to our work that really helps us stand out and that we can... Um, grow and encourage in each other and just makes the um i would say the knitting community and industry just a whole lot stronger and more enriched overall yeah i agree with you and i also really feel like it drives innovation because yeah. working with each other you know we've already seen that we were both pushed to work in different ways or to consider mm -hmm. you know different sources of, of, of inspiration or you know different ways of working within the network even though i i think maybe sometimes it's really easy to overlook like you just kind of look at finished project and you're like oh that's a nice thing but actually there's so much so much thought and there has been such a long process that goes on behind it in order to kind of get where we are so i really hope that my audience i'm, I'm sure will have will have enjoyed hearing more about it so the two patterns that i that are part of this collection for me so is the hat and a bandana cowl pattern so they both follow this uh, very similar uh, structure um type of thing so you know with a uh, lace stitch pattern with the mohair and then some textured stitches um the bandana cowl is going to have more of like a purple tinge to it because i'm using a purple mohair yarn to incorporate in it whereas this one is more silver um, they're both going to have similar names, Fetu Hat and the Fetu Cow. So Fetu means star in Te Reo Māori. I'm um, just keeping it really simple. In Māori art and things like that, um, the star stars do play a prominent role in a lot of our, a lot of our art, and they're often represented by like this little like basic like little X's. That's how can we represent that? So I did want to try and find a stitch pattern that kind of had like a little bit of like a X shape to it. Um, and finding that in the lace in a lace stitch pattern was a little bit challenging. So I hope I feel like this one was able to get pretty close enough to what I wanted to for that to represent. Just um for me, just keeping these patterns rather uh, simple in the concept, and then also the execution was just key for me here. And I was really quite surprised at like how warm the combination of wool and mohair come together to create a like a really cozy like this is really nice to wear. I'm just gonna say like this combination of yarns makes for a really comfortable uh, hat. So I'm really, and with the bandana cow, I'm sure that's gonna be really cozy as well. Yeah, definitely. And I went for a pair of fingerless gloves and a shawl. And again, I played with um, this slip stitch pattern to evoke the twinkling star. Oh, I have a beautiful. garter rig central portion. And then I played around with mohair and the striping in order to get this lovely translucent stitch pattern. So I've got three patterns going on in the shawl and all of the yarns that we used were quite heavy as well. We had the DK weight hand dyed yarns for the background and then we have lace weight mohair because that's really that's the standard weight of mohair that is sold and mohair silk blend that is. Um, but that's actually held double so it, it ends up being quite a fast knit all of the pieces even the shawl that is quite large. And we, we did design the collection to work all together so you can have the hat the bandana cowl, the shawl round your shoulders, and you can have the fingerless gloves as well, but also so that they're not completely matchy-matchy. So it was yeah. quite nice actually <laughs> to use similar yarns, you know, similar colours. So we have the navy blue, grey and lilac together. But yeah, sort of similarities and differences kind of, kind of playing off each other there. Yeah, that was fun. <laughs> our patterns are available to download separately on each of our websites. Yeah, and Ravelry as well. I mean, this was a really fun project to do. I'm finding that um, I really like collaborating with other designers to create collections, uh, mostly because, uh, I mean, for lots of reasons, like uh, like you mentioned earlier before, like this work can be very um, isolating, like it's a, solitary. And I'm finding that doing with other people, just meeting other people is just really fulfilling. Like it, you know, it's very... Um, brings a lot of like you know just personal value into my own life like it's like oh hey another person that I can talk to and geek about knitting with um and then also pushes my work as an artist like we're trying to find new ways to push the boundaries um and then also just in terms of just like you know um 
doing the work as well, like you can split it among people. Um, you don't have to do everything by yourself. Um, that was also something that I found out with when I was doing some other collaborations with another um, indigenous designer. I was just like, wow, I actually really like collaborating with other designers a lot. Like, it doesn't feel so lonely and you get to make new friends. Yes, definitely. And also it's it's nice to have like the motivation and, and especially because yeah. ours was loosely time bound. We wanted to get it all done in the winter. Yes. Um, just to have those those incentives. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with you about the spirit of collaboration. And thank you so much for saying yes to my email. Well, um, thank you for reaching out. <laughs> yeah, it's truly been a pleasure. And also a big thank you again to everybody who supports me on Patreon, especially those of you who made the suggestions. Um, I'm truly, truly thankful and couldn't do it without you. <laughs> um, Francoise, where can my viewers go if they want to find out the latest thing that you've been up to? Uh, so I'm mostly um, active on Instagram, although I haven't been super active for the past few weeks. Um, but you can follow me on Instagram at Aroha Knits. That's also my website and my Ravelry page. So you can just find me over there. I do have some hopefully exciting changes coming up uh, later on. I am slowing down on the pattern designing of things, but um, there are just a few collaborations that I'm going to be continuing to focus on um, for this upcoming year and some other exciting projects. So I guess if you want to stay in tune with that, just follow me on Instagram at Arohanets. Fabulous. And links for all of that, as well as our four individual patterns, can be found in the down bar here on YouTube, as usual. Well, thanks so much. And it's it's been an absolute pleasure. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.